When playing games with your friends, you probably don't think too hard about the economic principles behind valuing your opponents. However, you might want to start to. Now, microeconomics in particular studies the behavior of individuals and firms in decision making, particularly regarding the allocation of scarce resources and the interaction amongst said individuals and firms. Now, for games that focus primarily on bartering and trading goods, such as Sellers of Catan, it can be extremely beneficial to know how to recognize and address some of these microeconomic theories. Today we'll be using Porter's five forces to serve as a guide for how we can evaluate the competitive landscape of Catan and measure the potential you have to profit off of your resources. Let's get into it. God, like, can we talk about like the political and economic state of the world right now? Porter's five forces is a model that allows us to analyze any segment of the economy by recognizing how strong the competition is and how that competition impacts our ability to profit in this market. So the objective is to take these forces and apply it on a micro scale to a single player's production of, let's say, ore. These forces include the number and the power of a company's competitive rivals, potential new market entrants, suppliers, customers, and substitute products. All of these forces influence a company's profitability. So as we dive into each segment of this model, we'll be able to analyze how much of a competitive advantage we have in trading our resources. Now let's first dive into our existing competitors for trading ore, and how do we compare to them statistically, so just based on our hexes and our placements. Generally, the more competitive a market, the lower the profit opportunity. These three components will help us with our evaluation. Now all of these terms that we're going to be discussing today relate to the five forces from an industry perspective. What we're doing is taking these concepts and relating them to the game of Catan. First, how many competitors are there and how saturated is the market? These are the kind of questions we want to ask ourselves at the beginning of every single game before we even start trading. Here we see green and blue are direct competitors for trading ore because they're producing it at the same rate and at the same time. Now we can count the number of our competitors in two different ways. Let's say one, there's not a lot of people on ore tiles. Or two, sure there's a lot of people on ore tiles, but some of these tiles have a very low probability of being rolled. In these cases, the competition is weak. Next is the market diverse. So are there players in this game on other ore hexes that I'm personally not on? Now what are the differences in my ore hexes and theirs? Whether it being dice number or just location on the board and how does that impact the competition? Another way to look at diversity is how different the economy of each competitor is. So someone who produces just a little bit of ore and they have all the other resources, they might not even want to trade their ore away. Whereas someone with a huge influx of ore may always be open to trading. Now the third component is switching costs, aka what is the disadvantage or expense a customer incurs whenever they're changing who they're going to be buying the ore from. Within Catan, this is very circumstantial on position as well as just timing during the game. So some leverage you might personally have as a seller in getting a profitable trade is that your competition is in a far superior position. So in this example, a player who chooses to trade with brown instead of gray may incur a huge expense of helping the leader succeed anymore. It's important for Gray to recognize his position relative to competitors when negotiating trades and making sure he still captures value in him. Now that we've analyzed our current competition, let's look into the potential of new competition entering the market. So woohoo, congratulations, you settled on the five ore, it's a really strong hex. But people will be jealous and want to get in on the riches, so we should always look at how easy it may be for other people to do so. The barriers of entry are low in this instance when green is able to settle on the 9102, point the road up, and get onto the ore uncontested. By blue simply pointing their starting road to the right, this may incentivize green from contesting the 5-2 expansion altogether and help blue maintain their competitive advantage of being the only player on this 5 ore. This would be an example of a high barrier of entry into the ore market. The higher the barrier, the less the competition, and the better position blue will be in to profit off of their resources. Next, expected retaliatory actions. Since we're relating this to Catan, I actually want to take this in two different ways. First, how you and the other sellers will react, but also two, how the buyers will now react to both settlers being on this 5 ore. So first point, your red and orange just entered the ore market. If orange tries to trade away some of his ore and profit, you as red can retaliate and counter with a better offer for the buyer. Less profit for you, but at least orange wouldn't get this trade. 
This can also lead Orange to be more disincentivized from trying to profit off of his expansion spot in the future. Sort of an implication of the prior, other retaliations may come from the other players, as they now try to block a multi-shared hex. So not only is creating a high barrier of entry important to decrease competition, it may also keep others from targeting your ore income. Threat of new entrants, check. But we had to cover all five of these forces in order to complete our analysis. Next, we can look at supplier power. So in a business sense, this would be manufacturers who sell inputs to the companies, who then commercialize and sell to consumers. So suppliers in this case are just the hexes and dice. First off, differentiation of inputs. Simply put, this is when you're on multiple hexes of the same resource. Not only does this increase your volume in your production, but it also makes you difficult to block. No matter where the robber is, you'll have another source of income. Next, the actual strength of your hexes. Obviously, being on a 5 ore will, on average, not produce as much as being on a 6 ore. However, being in a stronger position, especially when the hex is shared with another player, can lead to the supply being completely cut off via the robber. The best and strongest distribution channels do a great job at balancing high production with also being an under-the-radar target. Lastly, there's also power and timing of the supply. In this example, green produces wood when black produces ore. So if a 10 rolls, this easily facilitates the opportunity for a trade to happen, rather than green having to wait for an ore to become available and vice versa. The convenience of getting what I want when I want it can drive up profits for the seller. Still with me so far? I just want to jump in here and announce that we are very close to hitting 1,000 subscribers on this channel, which will make me eligible for the partnership program and able to monetize this channel. So if you're enjoying this video and want to see more of this type of content, please consider hitting the subscribe button below. Let's jump to the other side and now look at buyer power. Generally, buyers are going to want lower prices or additional benefits when they make their trades. And our goal as sellers are, for the most part, the exact opposite. Now first off, let's see how many customers we actually have. If we have three people wanting our ore, there's going to be high demand. And this leads to competition among the buyers to get our product. Next, another concept we can relate to Catan is how much the buyer recognizes the benefit the seller is actually receiving from the trade. So in this example, if Snorkels recognizes that trade away two wheat would give the seller a city, they might be able to talk down the price and understand how imbalanced that trade might possibly be. Same goes for Snorkels knows that the other player has really strong down face development cards. Basically, if the buyer has more information on the position of the seller, the buyer therefore has more leverage, more power, and this results in less profit for the seller. Lastly, the presence of substitutes. So in this example, Orange is pretty reluctant to train a lot away for an ore because at the end of the day, they're able to four for one their sheep to get the ore that they want. As sellers, we really shouldn't panic too much about this happening. It's pretty circumstantial. What we should worry about, although, is getting our trades in before the buyer gets to a very powerful port. So if Red were to get to his sheep port on the six sheep, they may consistently have alternative ways of getting their ore and wouldn't need to trade with us anymore. Red now has more power as a buyer, which would result in less profit for us, the seller. Now, last but not least, our analysis would not be complete without diagnosing the threat of substitutes in our economy. Our fifth and final force relates a lot to the availability to port that we just discussed with the buyers. The difference here, however, is how well a player can use their port to become a seller to the remaining players. So in this case, Blue is able to turn two wood and or two sheep into any resource that she chooses. So on Blue's turn, she now has the flexibility to offer ore to other players when she has two wood or two sheep in her hand. This increases competition in the ore market. Now going one step further, Blue can even offer to get another player's two wood or sheep, turn it into what they need on her turn, and then trade it back. This is referred to as port servicing. Oftentimes, however, this service comes with a steeper price, just so the trade is not net zero. So if you want Blue to port your two wood for you, Oftentimes you'll have to throw in another resource or some sort of added benefit in order to make that happen. Another disadvantage to the buyer would be having to wait until it's the player with the port's turn in order to make that trade work. A lot can happen from when you make the trade until when it's finally your turn again. Get stolen, get monopoly, the game states just change in general, and thus the deal just becomes less attractive. As a seller, 
we are hoping these port servicers maintain their steep price and we're able to still wreak profit off of our trades. And those are our five forces. Collectively, they can serve as a guide to recognizing when to trade and how much you should be expecting to receive in return. Understanding the competitive landscape of the game leads you to having better placements, better blocks, better trades, and overall, better chance at winning. Shut up and take my money! Now the best way to practice these principles is by playing Catan online through colonist.io. Thousands of players every single day play Catan on colonist.io because it is easy to access, sleekly designed, and it's free to play. You can play with your friends, join public lobbies, or even enter into tournaments. And it doesn't stop there. You can also play the expansions of Catan that you know and love, or some crazy wacky maps that you may have never even seen before. Colonist.io is a site that I personally use for 100% of the Catan I play. I cannot recommend it enough. The link will be in the description below, and thank you Colonists for sponsoring this video. We are prepared to make you a very generous offer. And we are prepared to reject that offer. Improving at Catan, like many other things in life, is a very iterative process. And so everything I've discussed today will hopefully eliminate some of that learning curve and help reduce some of the error in the trial and error. Using a framework such as Porter's Five Forces will serve as sort of a checkbox for things to look out for and to keep at top of mind when trading and assessing your competition slash potential buyers. Now I'd like to reiterate that extracting profit off of some of your resources is not the only way to improve at Catan and win a game. Catan is much more complex than that. So if you're looking for more strategy videos geared towards placing or in-game decisions, you can check out some of the videos here. Now if you have any questions, suggestions, or counter arguments, please leave them down in the comments below. I'll make sure I address every single one of them. Thank you so much for watching.